before getting into the substance of my talk, I wanted to just underscore one thing. Um, I had the good fortune to have Edward Said as my dissertation supervisor at Columbia, and then for 10 years I taught alongside him as a colleague there. Uh, and one of the things that um, I think deserves being stressed at an occasion like this is not just the influence uh, and complexity of his ideas, but his commitment to communication per se as a public intellectual. It was the style with which he delivered his ideas across a broad spectrum of audiences. And certainly as a graduate student, that was what I took away from him more than anything else, was his readiness to meet audiences halfway, to adjust himself rhetorically. Uh, and that flexibility um, came with an aura of hope. And certainly in my own modest way, I have tried to transmit that hope to my students by encouraging them to develop a, a set of registers uh, across which they're comfortable communicating. These are both verbal and visual registers. And certainly I felt that uh, at a time when literary studies was very involuted, uh, impacted like, like a wisdom tooth, ingrown, uh, that there was a great um, power to Edward Said's example in his determined outwardness, his, his determination to communicate to broad audiences as well as to specialized ones. Now my own work uh, in recent years has been at the hinge between environmental studies and post-colonial studies. And for a long time, with a few exceptions, there was scarcely any hinge. Uh, the two fields uh, either tended to ignore each other or to treat each other with uh, mutual suspicion. A great deal uh, that has changed, but I remember a, a conversation in the 90s that I had with Edward Said at the time when deep ecology in particular was prevalent in the United States. Um, and over a series of conversations, uh, he, he talked about, uh, he was very dismissive of environmentalism, which he saw as a, a kind of a boutique politics um, a, a, for, for people who lacked a proper cause. Uh, and he didn't see any way in which it would be something more than um, a style of politics for, for the affluent and the predominantly white. At the time, I very much agreed with him. I, I was a political exile from South Africa, and I had seen some of the pernicious ways in which, under the banner of nature, uh, some profoundly awful policies had been perpetrated in South Africa, for instance, the declaring of conservation areas or national parks, and through that, the creation of conservation refugees, the forced removal of people in, under the name of nature into Bantustans and so forth. Um, so I was very aware of the complicities of a kind of green racism uh, or, or settler colonial, a green settler colonialism in the South African context and as I grew to know more about other contexts, including the occupied territories, I could see some related practices going on there. In the intervening years, and particularly in, in, in the decades since uh, Edward's passing, what we've seen is a gravitational shift in the center of environmental studies, including the environmental uh, humanities. And that gravitational shift has uh, allowed for uh, a larger space for environmental justice and the environmentalism of the poor. So what I'll be talking about today, uh, slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor, is very much integral to that shift as I see it. Uh, I thought I would start off by trying to ground the, the, the extremes on the spectrum of environmentalism uh, by looking at two videos. Uh, the only thing they have in common is uh, a sound, which is the sound of the chainsaw. Uh, so this is the first of the videos. <laughs> 
guess they're lots of contenders, but this bird must be one of them. The superb liar bird of South Australia. He clears a space in the forest to serve as his concert platform. Persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. Okay, so this is um, a recognizably uh, mainstream idea of an environmental storytelling. And part of the power and the plangency of this image is the idea of this preapic performance, uh, the seasonal song, incorporating into it uh, the soundtrack of Habitat Fracture. So it's literally sliced through uh, with the... the um, the prospect of its own demise, okay? And I just wanted to underscore a couple of features of this, um, this style of, of environmental storytelling, which is that it's a solitary encounter in which uh, the human is an intruder. We have uh, David Attenborough whispering his excitement half hidden behind a tree, okay? But it's an evacuated scene in which uh, a creature is center stage and other humans are off stage. And I wanted to contrast it with, with a second uh, chainsaw uh, video. Oh, it's 
An olive tree takes between seven to ten years to bear fruit. And the Israeli bulldozers uproot it and steal it in a minute. The tree for us as a Palestinians is a life. We will keep planting and we will keep on living. So in, in, in this wrenching scene, we have a very different kind of chainsaw. Uh, in the first instance with the lyrebird, the relationship between the bird and the chainsaw was an abstracted one, uh, serving as a kind of planetary allegory uh, for environmental threat. Here in the second video, what we have is a very specific conflict over resources between two uh, distinct uh, political entities. It's a militarized scene, it's a crowded scene, and like most environmental encounters, it happens not where people don't live, but where people live. Uh, and this is a, a segue into my discussion today of the environmentalism of the poor, uh, or the, 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 the difference between the environmentalism of the affluent and the environmentalism of the poor on the one hand, or what Ram Guha has called full stomach environmentalism versus empty belly environmentalism, where the stakes are livelihood and survival. And in this particular instance, the olive tree clearly uh, has an intergenerational power that it reaches down into the roots of cultural memory and cultural dignity, but also is implicated in community survival uh, per se. So I want to turn now and talk uh, about uh, slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor, uh, coming off of this, these, these videos and trying to help uh, direct uh, the environmental humanities in, in towards uh, a reconsideration of these questions of human violence within the environmental. We used to thinking of violence as immediate, explosive, and spectacular, as erupting into concentrated visibility. But I believe we need to think through the representational and strategic challenges posed by what are called slow violence. In other words, uh, forms of violence that are neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but are rather incremental and gradual as the calamitous repercussions of that violence are spread out across a range of time frames. So what I want to do then is to complicate conventional assumptions about violence as a bounded, highly visible act that is newsworthy because it is event-focused, bounded by time, and targeted at a specific body or bodies. Thinking through the temporal dispersion of slow violence, can impact the way that we uh, perceive and respond to a variety of crises uh, from uh, domestic abuse to uh, post-traumatic stress. But what I want to concentrate on today and what I focus on in the book uh, is rethinking environmental calamities through slow violence. So a major challenge facing us as environmentalists is how to create stories and images that can capture the slow motion catastrophes of delayed effects. Now this is an image from the 1940s. Um, the chem uh, chemical company in the United States was trying to um, quell public concerns that DDT might be harmful. Uh, so they chose this model and sprayed her with DDT. So that's a, a nimbus of toxicity transcendental toxicity that she's surrounded by here. They gave her a hot dog and a, a root beer. Um, and she's in evident robust good health and this was meant to placate uh, fears that DDT might actually have some harmful effects. So this is just a very um, blatant example of the, the persistent industrial and military attempts to contract the time frame of harm or violence. Um, and this is particularly evident um, 
uh, in, in the so-called uh, environmental struggles in the so-called Global South. If we think of the following examples of slow violence, climate change, the thawing cryosphere, the slow toxic drift of agricultural nitrates uh, from the American heartland down the Mississippi, creating a dead zone in the Gulf of uh, Mexico that's larger than Belgium. If we think of oil spills, deforestation, acidifying oceans, biomagnification, and a host of other slow unfolding environmental disasters, uh, the, the, all of these co confront us with formidable representational challenges that can impede our efforts to create stories and images around which to mobilize. Crucially, slow violence is often not just accumulative, uh, but exponential. In other words, it operates as a major threat multiplier, creating resource bottlenecks uh, and fueling long-term these proliferating conflicts that result. Different kinds of disaster are granted unequal coverage in our media-driven world. Falling bodies, burning towers, exploding heads, avalanches, volcanoes have a visceral page-turning potency. The tales of slow violence which unfold over months, years, even centuries, cannot match. This is an image uh, from the, as a familiar image from the deep water horizon uh, blowout in the Gulf of Mexico a couple of years ago. Stories of toxic buildup, massing greenhouse gases, accelerated species loss due to ravaged habitats, all, have a cata all may be cataclysmic, but they are scientifically convoluted cataclysms in which casualties are postponed often for generations. So a crucial question for us to face then is how in an age that reveres spectacle and when public policy is shaped primarily around perceived immediate need, how in these circumstances can we convert into image and story disasters that are slow moving and long in the making, disasters that are anonymous and celebrity deficient, Disasters that are gradual and of indifferent interest to the sensation-driven technologies of our media world. In other words, how can we turn the long emergencies of slow violence into stories dramatic enough to rouse public sentiment and warrant political intervention? Uh, and that's one of the waves in the Gulf of Mexico with the Corexit, the, the, the dispersant, which has had such a deleterious effect enfolded into the, the wave uh, with the oil particles as well. To address the challenges of slow violence is to confront the dilemma that Rachel Carson faced 50 years ago as she sought to dramatize what she called death by indirection. Carson's subject were biomagnification and toxic drift. These forms of oblique slow acting violence like climate change uh, pose formidable difficulties for writers and activists alike. Uh, and Carson herself talked about the challenges in dealing with toxicity of, um, of, of trying to represent what she called shadows that are no less ominous because they are formless and obscure. So trying to find the form for these kind of stories. So let me ground my thinking on slow violence here with a couple of specific historical examples. Wars whose lethal repercussions sprawl across time are typically book-ended in the historical record. Uh, just to take one example, a recent New York Times editorial declared that, uh, quote unquote, during our dozen years in Vietnam, the US killed 1.5 million people, unquote. But that simple word during shrinks the toll. As we know, hundreds of thousands of, of people survived the war years only to lose their lives prematurely to Agent Orange. The afflicted included thousands of children, many thousands of children, born decades after the, year, the, the war's official end. Uh, and so that 30, more than 30 years after the last spraying run of Agent Orange, uh, the the toxins continue to wreak havoc through biomagnification, moving up the food chain. And indeed, as recently as 2009, the US Institute of Medicine 
uh, declared that the research had revealed that high levels of exposure to Agent Orange uh, increased the likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease and ischemic heart disease. So the science uh, is, is, is catching up uh, with, the, with the after effects of the war. Okay. Slow violence casualties are hidden from view even more dramatically uh, in, in circumstances where depleted uranium munitions have been deployed. Uh, st starting with the 1990 uh, Gulf War. Depleted uranium, as many of us know, uh, possesses a durability almost beyond human comprehension. It has a radioactive half-life of 4.51 billion years. When it enters the environment, depleted uranium effectively does so for all time. And many in the US military uh, readily concede this uh, this is just one such quote from uh, Colonel James Norton. We feel we have to use depleted uranium. It's radioactive. I wish it wasn't. But I can't change the laws of physics. The issue is once you've had a hit, once you've involved in the catastrophic failure of the tank, did the crew survive long enough to really care whether it was tungsten or depleted uranium that hit them? Anyone who does should count themselves damn lucky. I'm sure every soldier would thank God that he lived 40 years to contract lymphoma, unquote. Okay. So what he's saying quite bluntly here is that heat of battle, lethality, or violence always trumps deferred violence. Clearly, what he's also not considering is the after effects, not for uh, US soldiers, but for the residents who long-term must inhabit that environment. And we know from the hospital records at Fallujah and Basra uh, the, the beginnings of the consequences of that. So in our age of depleted uranium warfare, we have an ethical obligation, I believe, to challenge the military body counts that consistently underestimate, both in advance and in retrospect, the true toll of waging so-called high-tech wars. Who is counting the staggered deaths from civilian, uh, uh, that civilians and soldiers suffer from ingested depleted uranium? Who is counting the belated fatalities from unexploded cluster bombs that morph into landmines? Who is counting deaths from chemical residues left behind by so-called pinpoint bombing, residues that turn into foreign insurgents infiltrating native rivers? and poisoning the food chain? Who is counting the victims of genetic deterioration, the stillborn, malformed infants conceived to parents whose children, uh, whose DNA has been scrambled by war's toxins? The calculus of any conflict needs to incorporate such environmental casualties. They may suffer slow, invisible deaths that don't fit the news cycle at Fox News or CNN but they remain war casualties nonetheless. I want to turn now to a, a, a second uh, material example, or, uh, historical example of slow violence. Um, and this has to do with the Greenbelt Movement in Kenya, which some of you may know about. Uh, Wangari Maathai, one of the leaders of the movement and the movement itself, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 2005. So this is a very different type of struggle uh, against slow violence, specifically against deforestation and the loss of topsoil that had resulted from rampant exploitation and deregulation of the environment in Kenya under Arab Moy. And so particularly through the 1980s and, and early 1990s, under an authoritarian regime, uh, a large uh, group of uh, rural women in Kenya mobilized to plant trees uh, as a kind of a, 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 a counter to this loss of, of topsoil. And, and uh, uh, this, is, this is a quote from Wangari Maathai's memoir. During the rainy season, thousands of topsoil, tons of topsoil are eroded from Kenya's countryside by rivers and washed into the ocean and lakes. Additionally, soil is lost through wind erosion in areas where the land is devoid of vegetative cover. Losing topsoil 
should be considered analogous to losing territory to an invading enemy. And indeed, if any country were so threatened, it would mobilize all available resources, including a heavily armed military, to protect the priceless land. Unfortunately, the loss of soil through these elements has yet to be perceived with such urgency. Okay. So what Matai is doing very productively here, I think, is reformulating the idea of security in terms of the long durée. And uh, she and the Greenbelt movement went on to plant something like 100 uh, million trees to anchor the soil and also to connect those acts to a broader sense of civic agency among the rural poor. Uh, planting the seeds of peace became a, a metaphor for, for literally uh, grassroots uh, democracy, bringing to the surface the kind of uh, vegetative energy, if you like, within that dead metaphor. Uh, this reminded me, or brought to mind, the one of uh, Banksy's image from, uh, images from his Bethlehem series. Uh, and the power in this image has to do with the fact that it's not simply uh, the dismemberment of the resources of the landscape through the pulling down of the tree, but it's specifically the decapitation. It's a mindless act uh, that ignores the arterial energies beneath the surface, the subterranean connection between the life of the tree and the survival of the humans on the surface. I think it's helpful here to situate slow violence in relation to some of the changes in the ways that we now inhabit time. Ours is an age of onrushing digital capitalism where the present feels more abbreviated than it used to, at least for the world's privileged classes who live surrounded by technological time savers, which often ironically leave us, leave us feeling time poor. Consequently, one of the most pressing challenges of our age is how to adjust our rapidly eroding attention spans to the slow erosions of environmental justice. If under neoliberalism, the gulf between enclave rich and outcast poor has become ever more pronounced, ours is also an age of enclave time in which um, speed has become a self-justifying ethic that leaves uh, so-called uneventful violence a weak claimant on our time. So in an age of degraded attention spans, it becomes doubly urgent to focus on the toll exacted over time by the slow violence of environmental degradation. To uh, Cory Doctorow has, has described us as living in an era when the electronic screen has become an ecosystem of interruption technologies, an ecosystem of interruption technologies. Or as former Microsoft executive Linda Stone puts it, ours is an age of quote unquote continuous partial attention. Fast is faster than it used to be and story units have become concomitantly shorter. So to make slow violence visible entails redefining speed. We see such efforts in, in talk of accelerated species loss, not just species loss, but accelerated species loss, rapid climate change, and in attempts to um, transform the metaphor, the dead metaphor of glacial, which used to mean uh, uh, unspeakably slow, into a metaphor for unacceptably rapid loss. What does it take in an age of fractured attention spans to represent effectively the science of long-term damage? Let me ground this question by turning to attempts by the leaders of the Indian, Island, uh, Indian Ocean Island nation of the Maldives to re represent the attritional threat posed by climate change. Someone mentioned uh, yesterday the ambiguous relationship of the Dutch towards the sea. Uh, this is even more acute in the case of the Maldivians. Uh, Maldives is a pretty isolated chain of atolls, about 300,000 people uh, in the Indian Ocean. 
And this is an image of the seawall around Malé, uh, the capital. Uh, uh, and this was after the tsunami when the seawall was breached. And the wall is significant because one of the, I think one of the characteristic features of our age is the widening gap between the uber-rich and the ultra-poor. Uh, in environmental justice terms, those who are walled off from the consequences of their actions and those who feel disproportionately the burden of the fallout of those actions, be it uh, cl climate change or toxicity. Uh, and here is an example where, with the acidifying and warming oceans, the coral reefs had died, and so the seawall was a geo-engineered kind of surrogate attempt uh, to protect the island, which at, at its highest point is, is seven feet. But I chose the, the, the image of the Maldives because um, they're in line to become one of the first nations of climate refugees. Uh, and so even if we're talking 40, 50 years out, there is, for the people of that nation, a great immediate urgency. Uh, but they faced two great challenges. In the first place, they're an obscure nation, a very small and obscure nation, uh, that very people, few people know of or pay attention to. And in the second place, the crisis that they're trying to dramatize is an attritional crisis of slow violence uh, that is difficult to infuse with current urgency. Um, so the president of um, Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed, uh, in 2009, organized an underwater climate uh, summit in which his nation declared that they would be carbon neutral within 10 years. Okay. This was just before the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit of 2009, and it was a very successful attempt to garner attention to, in, in, in terms of what Robert was talking about uh, just now, uh, to heighten the visibility of the, uh, this nation state. So this sea change uh, involved a uh, kind of underwater performance art. I teach at a large state university, so I know what it's like to drown in paperwork. Uh, but this is an attempt uh, to oxygenate uh, the future uh, and to dramatize the costs of wasted foreknowledge. So we can read it as a kind of a preview of the aftermath, uh, starting in the Maldives but ultimately affecting uh, coastal areas in particular everywhere. So it dramatizes uh, in ways that resonate with uh, both Katrina and Hurricane Sandy uh, the, the different plights, but ultimately connected plights, of the coastal rich and the coastal poor. I also read this uh, translucent ghostly underwater scene as a, an image of reverse inundation. Um, we're all used to the uh, language in relation to immigration of swamping, uh, uh, inundation, drowning. Um, uh, Sir Margaret Thatcher died recently and during the 80s in particular in Britain, uh, the image of being swamped by immigrants was uh, very, very prevalent. So I read this as an image of reverse inundation. Here it's not uh, brown and black bodies threatening white fortress cultures, but the fallout for uh, predominantly brown and black people of the world of a 200-year carbon-fueled experiment, the primary beneficiaries of which have been rich and white. And this image then strikes at the heart of the climate justice movement, at the inequities between those who have grown disproportionately wealthy of carbon culture and the predominantly poor uh, black, brown and black people who live in the first line of fire of the climate crisis. 
This language of inundation and drowning is, is pervasive, as I say, but this is just one example of that um, from the Great Gatsby. Civilization's going to pieces. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man, Godard? The idea is that if we don't look out for the white race, we'll, we'll be utterly submerged. Okay, so that's a kind of counterpoint to the Maldivian image. Flag planting until recently was more associated with mountain peaks and ocean depths. Uh, and as part of the series of images from the Maldives, there's one of the Maldivian flag on the sea bottom. And so it's an image of involuntary conquest of a nation state sinking towards extinction over the long term. And I can't think of that flag without thinking of a second flag that, went, uh, w that was planted at almost identical time uh, by the Russians uh, in the um, uh, Arctic Shelf. And the, the leader of the Russian expedition, Artur uh, Chilingarov, said, the Arctic is Russian. And this was a very different kind of oceanic land grab, not an ironic uh, flag of inverted conquest, but a militarized declaration of, uh, of uh, seizure and was followed by uh, very anxious uh, militant claims from US, Norway, EU, um, Canada, and others. So global warming was the trigger for the, this militant rhetoric and these troop movements. Melting Arctic pack ice had opened the prospect of new sea lanes and was exposing hitherto inaccessible minerals, above all oil and gas. So we face the, 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 the now familiar prospect of expanded uh, suboceanic carbon reserves being extracted and burned courtesy of global warming, accelerating the very processes of slow violence that will drown the Maldives first, but which unchecked will ultimately breach the neoliberal walls that concretize a planetary delusion. The delusion that long term we can segregate um, uh, secure communities from insecure ones and separate out orderly societies from those abandoned to climate chaos. From the perspective of climatic slow violence, the so-called Arctic carbon bonanza gives a whole new meaning to the race to the bottom. Uh, we can also read this image in the Maldives as a, as a kind of giving an oceanic twist to the anti-colonial phrase the development of underdevelopment. Thinking of the Maldives brought me back to a line from Benjamin Britten's um, Peter Grimes, and being, this being a Said occasion, I thought we needed at least one reference to opera. Uh, and the line is uh, pierced, pierced in this metal scallop in, in the Suffolk coast. I hear those voices that will not be drowned. I hear those voices that will not be drowned. Uh, again, it returns to Robert's point about visibility and audibility uh, and assumes a prescience, particularly in regard to the uh, climate crisis, the rising tides of the climate crisis. Edward Said wrote of what he called the normalized quiet of unseen power, the normalized quiet of unseen power. This normalized quiet is of particular relevance, I suggest, to the hushed havoc and harmful invisibility that slow violence generates. It's the poor and above all the impoverished populations of the so-called global south who inhabit the front lines of slow violence. The invisibility of their poverty exacerbates, is exacerbated by the invisibility of the slow violence that permeates so many of their daily existence. Our temporal bias towards spectacular instantaneous violence increases the vulnerability of ecosystems dis treated as disposable by an onrushing capitalism, while simultaneously exacerbating the vulnerability of those whom Kevin Bales has called disposable people. It is against such combined ecological and human disposability that we have witnessed a resurgent environmentalism of the poor, particularly across the so-called global south. And I just want to end with one image of this. Um, some of you may recognize this 
figure. Uh, it's Ken Sarawiwa, who's a writer, activist, the, probably the most uh, celebrated environmental martyr in Africa, who was executed by the Abacha regime in 1995 for his opposition to the uh, despoilation of his, land, uh, his people's lands and waters in the Niger Delta uh, by Shell and Chevron on the one hand and by um, the Nigerian regime, authoritarian regime at, at the time. So what he was protesting was uh, an unspeakable regime and an unanswerable and unanswerable corporations that were operating in cahoots. And the result had been the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez spillage every year for 50 years. Um, now, what was so striking was that I was traveling in the west of Ireland near uh, Rossport a couple of summers ago and came across this mural. Uh, the, the mural is not in Nigeria, but in the west of Ireland. And this community there was facing uh, the threat of gas drilling, offshore gas drilling, uh, in, their, in, their, in their estuary. Uh, and it was Shell that had been given the, the license to do this without any uh, regulatory oversight whatsoever. And so this historic fishing village uh, was reaching out internationally for other places that had had to deal with this threat. And so that through, through, the, through the arts, they were creating some kind of transnational resonance from the estuary people in the mangrove uh, swamps of the Niger Delta to the west coast of Ireland, which historically had been, also been very poor and heavily colonized. And so this was really, um, to me, quite remarkable that you have the, the names of the eight, the Agoni eight who were executed with Sarawiwa and one of Sarawiwa's poems of protest translated into Gaelic. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Who would like to begin the questioning? Are there any, nobody here? Any? Ah, right. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, an absolutely powerful and fascinating talk that has caught up a couple of um, strands that I've heard over today and yesterday. Um, f first of all, they're the kind of the slow violence and the very um, b the bodies that are produced. And I was thinking of sort of Lauren Ballant's cruel optimism of mm -hmm. the, 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 the body of the obese, but also, of course, um, in Beth Povinelli's work and others of the, the generational abuses of, in what I know, Aboriginal people or First Nations people, which are dealing with both that, you know, um, in Australia, 100, 200 years of um, poisoning and all the rest of it now, as we were talking yesterday, with the ravages of finding gas on their lands. Um, but there was just that oceanic moment, and I had to say, I'm sure you know this, but um, the Maldives is where multinationals are sourcing so-called sustainable tuna, um, which then is shipped to Thailand to be canned and then sold under home brands in Walmart or wherever. So, I mean, it is just hor horribly ironic. Yeah. But I, And I don't know where this could go, but mm. I was thinking to um, Judith's point yesterday, um, amongst the many points, but of the, the, that act of definitional violence of who tills the land and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the kind of slightly different thing when you're thinking about the, the oceanic um, and the, the effects that we're now seeing. So it's not really a question. And if I really wanted you to answer something, what I'd love to know is what types of strategies do you teach your students in that course you were talking about mm -hmm. yesterday? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, strategy is, is huge. And a lot of the students that I teach come from the environmental sciences, and a lot of them come from the arts. So a lot of them are creative types. They're working in digital media and so forth across different platforms. Uh, I, I try to start from where they are, which is Wisconsin. And one of the things about Wisconsin, having moved from Columbia to Wisconsin, the center of country, the most prominent uh, issue in terms of um, 
cultural conflict has to do not with African-American white relations, but native white relations. There are a number of uh, native reservations in the state, and we have uh, a large body of native students. Uh, and so, so there have been a series of conflicts. The most famous of them and the most successfully uh, opposed was one called the Crandon Mine, which was a copper and zinc mine in the north of the state. And what happened was that it was, going, it was adjoining the, the wild rice plantations, the uh, uh, wild rice um, crops that, that require clean water. And so the tailings were going to flow into that and destroy centuries of, uh, of tradition in terms of wild rice. And what happened was a coalition of sort of white hunters, fishermen, uh, um, native activists and environmentalists went across the state from church hall to church hall, from town hall to town hall, uh, talking about the different reasons why they thought this mine was a bad idea and BHP Billiton, uh, Rio Tinto, some nefarious South African corporations, Canadian. Uh, they all, over a period of decades, tried to get this mine started. And one of the strategies, in, in addition to the local uh, coalition building uh, that they used was they had a convention of native activists from across the Americas so from places like Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Ontario, Alaska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and that. About 400 of these activists got together and uh, shared strategies, shared their encounters with the transnationals. So there would be a number of people, say, who'd been working with Rio Tinto and said when they came in, they promised 2,000 jobs. They brought 1,900 of their own people. Uh, they promised that they would uh, clean up the tailings 30 years later that it hasn't been done and so forth. So there was a pooling transnationally of resources and a local strategy. So that was, that was just one example um, that we've used. Another sort of encouraging example from, from Bolivia, I wonder if I have an image of that. Uh, yeah. Um, a few months ago, I think it was last year, uh, that... Uh, a Brazilian uh, tra a transnational corporation had been given permission to build a road through the lowlands of the Amazon. And the, uh, the, the tribes there uh, were, were absolutely opposed to this, both in terms of the colonists coming in and, and starting attritionally to appropriate their lands, and in terms of loss of biodiversity, in terms of cultural survival. So they started a, a march to La Paz, uh, up at the, the capital, and uh, the march lasted something like two months. And they were literally drumming up support. They had bands and music and that along the way, and other members joined them. And by the time they got to the main plaza in, in La Paz, uh, um, the, 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 the president, uh, had, uh, Evo Morales, uh, said, OK, the road's not going to happen. Uh, but it was, a, it was two months of performance theater uh, that gradually built media coverage, they turned their invisibility into a kind of a spectacle that ultimately was successful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for a very inspiring talk, and I think you're addressing here one of the very crucial issues of politics today. Um, and more or less in reply to the, to, the, to the question that was just being asked, I was wondering whether uh, this concept that you were using, the notion of slowness, um, shouldn't be replaced by the fact that this kind of power is really uh, kind of invisible. Because um, I think that if you look at the various uh, examples that you gave, there is actually quite a lot of speed involved when it comes to environmental deprivation. But uh, the major problem, I would say, is that it has no face. So mm. it is, right. in a way, uh, and this is a very anthropocentric concept that I'm using right now, mm -hmm. uh, it, is, uh, it is faceless, mm -hmm. a faceless enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Do you want to take Just a few more? to your okay. right, yes. Let's take those two together, if we may. Um, yes, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to bring the conversation a little bit back to Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you talk about the depredation and the um, destruction of the Palestinian geography in the olive trees in the West Bank, but, it, but Israel claims a green card. Basically, Israel claims green credibility and it's recognized internationally in the environmental movement for its green policies. Now, those afforestation policies are what have, you know, since 48, grown over Palestinian destroyed villages within the state of Israel. And currently, um, that afforestation is destroying and displacing um, the Bedouin from the mm -hmm. Negev, the Nakab. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you could comment on that relationship between slow violence yes. and the claim for environmental um, credibility. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, those are great questions. Um, yes, I, th I think slow violence I I is very much connected to invisibility, and it's partly that the decisive cycles of time, whether it's news cycle or political cycle, say in the United States, two-year uh, electoral cycles, um, midterms and then, and then uh, four-year elections, uh, are so short that Politicians have very little incentive to invest in these long-term considerations. So the damage they create will not um, harm their political reputations or their electability. And similarly, um, something like tree planting will not redound to their credit when the trees may take decades to grow. Uh, and so that's why we need uh, civic protests and civic actions outside of the formal outside of the institutional time frames uh, that uh, can, can cynically um, count on this invisibility and the slowness. The, the question of invisibility uh, was, was uh, driven home to me recently. I was listening to some, a report on the BBC World Service and it was about uh, a, a protest again in the Amazon in Peru this time and uh, some Peruvian activists who were trying to protect the forest had been killed. And one of the activists who was anonymous, who was interviewed on the BBC, said those people were dead to the eye before they were killed. Those people were dead to the eye before they were killed. And that is, a, is an absolutely critical issue, that certain peoples are, or communities are rendered disposable because they can be counted on as unseen fatalities. And so that is another critical side to the environmental justice movement is changing the unequal playing field of visibility, if you like. To the second point, um, one of the books I teach in my environmental studies course is, is, is After the Last, Last Sky, and another is uh, Raja Shehadeh's Palestinian Walks, uh, where he, he, he looks, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a personal memoir, but it's also a reflection on the militarization of the landscape and the entanglement between the greening of the land and the militarization of that land, and the way in which um, forests and, and trees and so forth can create a, a screen memories of a sort and a, a bury history through vegetation, for example. Uh, and th th one of the most powerful things in that book is his meditation on a particular thistle, a native thistle, uh, which when he's out uh, walking the hills of Ramallah and trying to decompress from his legal work, he's a legal, legal scholar working on land claims, he encounters that thistle and it takes him back to the courtroom because wherever that thistle was, uh, Israelis would say, this is wasteland, this is abandoned land, this is sign of Palestinian neglect, and it could be used as a, a trigger for land seizure. And so this, is, this to me was very um, familiar from, from South Africa that there was a, a, a politics to botany uh, that the green conservationists, colonial conservationists, in a South African context, uh, manipulated uh, so that uh, black claimants to the land were positioned always as poachers or agriculturally ignorant and so forth. So there's a long colonial history of that. Yeah. 
Thank you for your interesting speech. Uh, I just would like to ask one question. Taking into consideration... Could you speak up a bit, please, because we can't hear you. Okay. Maybe, thank you. Uh, taking into consideration the Israeli colonial actions of uh, slow violence, as you have mentioned or uh, 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 directed early, uh, especially the uprooting of olive trees, uh, the daily uprooting of olive trees, uh, uh, of uh, Palestinian farmers. Can we relate this uh, kind of experience to what happened to the Native Americans uh, uh, in the United States? And how would this kind of uh, actions would affect the well-being of Palestinians in the long run? And uh, what do you think if this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of actions would be taking place for like 20 years? And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yes, I do think uh, there are some analogies to what happened to the Native Americans. Uh, we know that, for instance, with the Plains Indians, uh, there was a, 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 a symbiotic relationship with the buffalo herds, and so the decimation of the buffalo uh, was part of a genocidal strategy, uh, whereby uh, the, the not just a food source, but a whole ecology of being uh, and, and a cultural dignity was uh, um, uh, kind of uh, under assault. And clearly the olive trees are both a, a source of food, uh, and, uh, but also an embodiment, an intergenerational embodiment of cultural belonging. Uh, that it's, it's, it's a connection to the land, particularly because olive trees can grow to such a great age. Uh, that the idea of the rootedness of memory itself, particularly for a people under constant threat of dispossession, uh, has an extraordinarily uh, great potency. Yeah. 